All right, uh, welcome to the Branding Iron Podcast, episode two. Uh, I'm we're two. Here, yeah, episode two. Wow. Um, you might know. Um, Who's number one? I feel. I feel. Jet. Michelle. Michelizzi. Yeah. Uh, no, no, wait a minute. It's Melissa McKinley. <laughs> so the, the, try to say that back to back. <laughs> so I'm here with uh, Michelle Michelizzi. Um, you get ten years to get that right. Just so you know. I, did Sorry. I say it right? You did. All right. Cool. Oh. First time. Yeah, but it's spelling it. So different no, yeah. There's no spell check for that. So. <laughs> um, t- why don't you give us the backstory uh, a little bit about, you know, what are you doing right now? And then we'll get back into, you know, your sort of origin story. Uh, go for it. Okay. So uh, my name is Michelle Michelizzi and my company is Michelizzi Enterprises. And what I do is I help business owners to collaborate way out of the box. And so uh, what does that mean? Um, Five years ago when I started the company, um, I basically started initially as just an advanced project manager. Okay. You know, so kind of like an entrepreneur for hire. Um, The reason why was because when I was in this, you know, kind of reincarnation of myself, I thought, you know, what am I really best at? So what, what are you talking about a reincarnation for? Well, I've had six companies. Okay. So, so, th- so it was, it was time a, to start another company. All right. You can't stop yourself. It, it can't. It's like all one right. of those problems I have, right? Okay. Serial entrepreneur. And I thought, well, if I look back on all of the JOBs I've had, the jobs, where mm-hmm. I've worked in corporate America and I've worked for small companies, and I look back on all of my, my own companies, what am I really best at? Like if I distill it down to the core essence, what am I really best at? I'm really good at getting shit done. Okay. I know that sounds like, yeah, so what, right? But you know as an entrepreneur that there's a lot of people that talk about doing stuff <laughs> and they actually don't ever actually execute, right? Right. A lot of talk. So for a while, I called myself a business executor. Okay. So I execute projects, right? So that kind of confused people because no one ever heard of that. So I spent a lot of time explaining <clears throat> that. So I just went back to that word consultant. I hate the word consultant hmm. because it kind of has a bad rap. Why is that? Um, it's funny. My, my friend Gregory Heider who's my realtor and also a member of my BNI, yeah. um, was saying that just because you have a job doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur. Just because you don't have a job doesn't mean you're an entrepreneur. Oh, okay, yeah. And yeah. somebody said, oh, like a consultant. So I think consultant gets a bad rap. <clears throat> but it's the word that people get that you're hiring someone externally to come do something in your company, okay. right? So a lot of consultants will go in and kind of give you your walking papers. They'll go in and say, you need to do this, this, and this, and that, and then I'm out. Here's your bill. Yeah. What I do is I roll my sleeves up so, and I get yeah, into the trenches with you. So now you're like, you. great, thanks for the tip. Yeah, thanks for Who's giving me more to worry about. Stuff? Right. Who's going to do the work? Yeah. So what I do is I roll my sleeves up and actually do the work. Okay. And what makes me different is that, number one, I've been self-employed literally my entire life. I grew up in a family business, and so literally from the time I came out of the womb until this moment, I've always had my own company. You never worked for anybody else? I have. I've that, worked for corporate that, America, though. and I've worked for small companies. And, you know, it, it works because I'm actually equally <clears throat> as good of a follower as I am a leader. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, what ends up happening is um, I can't help myself but try to improve on what's there, right? Yeah. So um, so, so what I've discovered is, is that, you know, as an entrepreneur and as an employee of a, a small company and as an employee of large companies, what businesses most need is people to actually get things done. And so the cl- my ideal client is somebody who is kind of ready to level up. They've already gotten a certain level of success. Okay. Um, they're not in the starving mode where they can't pay me, right? Yeah. They're in the, meh, they're, they're grossing more than 250. They okay. basically have enough money coming in to get themselves into trouble. Okay. And they have a bunch of different projects that need to get done, but they're all different skill sets. So maybe there's a marketing project, there's an operational project, there's a growth project, there's a development project, there's a design project. So to hire one person to do all that, it's very hard to find one person that has that skill set. What makes me unusual is that I am like a utility player. Okay. Um, You mentioned uh, design. So you you went to art school, right? I did. My first two degrees are in art. So I have a degree. How many degrees do you have? I have two degrees and one one advanced certification. Well, actually several certifications, but as far as (laughs) education is concerned. So I have a degree in fine art with a concentration in photography. Okay. And then I have a, I went back to school. I graduated in 89. You know what happened in 89? Adobe came on board and the whole world changed, right? Right. So I went back to school at Pratt Manhattan. And at that point they didn't have an associates or a, um, they didn't have a degree in computer design yet. Oh, okay. So was, you, so I got, a, I got a certification in computer design from Pratt Manhattan, which is one of the best art schools in the country. It was a really cool opportunity. And then I went back again um, 
10 years later to get a master's in administration. So from that, the same school? No, nope, different school from St. From Michael's. It's one of the top okay. uh, programs in the country. And basically what that program was, like the, it's like a hybrid uh, program between the MBA and the MPA. Uh, so the master's in business administration, the master's of public administration. Mm, okay. So it has all the balance sheet, marketing, you know, heady business stuff. And then it has all the people, community, philanthropy, um, community development stuff of the MPA. So you kind of have a... You're both sides of the of the coin. You've got the art side and the, um, what would you call it, the, the business side, I guess. Yeah, Not yeah. that business isn't an art, but... Oh, I think the business absolutely is yeah, an art. Yeah, it's uh, the more analytical side mm-hmm. and then the artistic side, which is, is more uh, free-flowing, I suppose. Um, you know what mm-hmm. I've learned over the years? I have a project that I do called The Art of Fearlessly Doing Business. And what I do is I interview business owners and I ask them how they started their company Um, what fears they had to overcome to start it, and what they can tell others about being fearless now, right? Uh And what I've learned over the um, 64 interviews I've done and the 85 blogs that I've written is that um, I used to think that my entrepreneurial brain, my business brain, was one side of my brain, and then that my creative side was the other side. Then you put on a different hat or right. whatever. Right, and I, it was constantly, and you and I, are, you're a musician and a, and a business person, and I'm an, I'm an artist and a business person. Yeah. So we had the same the battle all the time, like who's going to win, right? The good wolf or the bad wolf, and depending upon the day, yeah. you know, who's wearing which hat <laughs> changes, right? Yeah. But what I found from interviewing other entrepreneurs is that my entrepreneurial brain and my artist brain are the same brain. Because entrepreneurs create something from nothing. They solve problems, and that's what artists do. That's what musicians do. They take something in their mind that is a concept or an idea, and they put legs on it. Well, that's what entrepreneurs do. Whether you're designing Apple computer, or mm-hmm. you're designing the next best widget, or the next best microphone, or computer, or whatever the, whatever it might be, or whether you're writing a song, writing a poem, writing a story, or, or painting something, you're taking a concept that is in your mind, and you're, you're putting legs on it. Mm-hmm. It's the mm-hmm. same skill set. Right. Okay. So the only the, the only difference would be the purpose, I suppose. So one is to you know entertain yourself. Um, Maybe. You know, I make music for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and but you play out. You play to people, right? You yeah. Play in but front of people. I only. I don't really care if they like it or not. So. Well, you know what's really you know, funny. But when you're in a business, you're like, okay, listen, I'm I am kind of doing it for for me. I'm solving my own problem, and maybe I can help other people. But it's not so um, inward looking or you know, you know I don't know about that. I just I have a radio show called Relentless Talk Radio, yeah. and I'm revisiting a series of blogs that I did. It's at Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. at Central City Radio, by the way. It's an okay. internet internet radio station. So I'm revisiting a series of blogs that I wrote in 2016 about entrepreneurial traits, and it's funny because I'm doing them in the order that I wrote them. Just, okay. Just. Out well, of curiosity, you know, re-reading right? Rereading them or what? Well, re- revisiting them on the radio oh, okay, and yeah. focusing conversations around these blogs that I wrote in 2016. And seeing if anything's changed and you're like, can you add an addendum to it or no, nope, it's still the same. It's still, well, it's basically kind of revisiting it for myself, but okay. also having a, an additional conversation. I like to revisit things because the people that saw my blogs two years ago, maybe the new, new people haven't seen them, right? Right. So the, the last week's blog was about, um, um, Oh my God, passion. Okay. And Guy um, Kawasaki, which I, I want to say Kowalski, but it's <laughs> Kawasaki, right? Um, and I, it's funny, I, I said Kowalski all, it, it, t- several times in my radio show the other day. Um, but one of the things that he talked about in an interview that he did, he was supposed to talk about the art of enchantment at some workshop he was at, and yeah. it was the day that Steve Jobs died. Okay. And he had worked for Steve Jobs the first Apple time around and then the second Apple time around. So he was actually one of the few people who actually had worked for him twice. So he yeah. ended up making his talk kind of impromptu mm-hmm. about the 12 things that he learned from Steve Jobs. And one of the things he said was you can't, um, you, basically you can't ask your customers what they need because they don't know what they need. Like nobody well, would have a, ever thought. That's a definite Steve Jobs. Absolutely. Line, right? you can't, nobody would have ever thought. I mean, like, I'm going to tell you what you need by saying, hey, you didn't even know. That you were going to need a uh, an iPod, right? Because nobody, you know, that wasn't there. How about an iPad? How about you know all, all that. those kinds of things? So what he, but the the concept basically being to bring it back to what you were saying is that Steve Jobs created things that he thought were beautiful and functional for himself, 
And then he convinced other people they were beautiful and functional for them. He's and a I promoter. think that any true yeah. artist yeah. or true entrepreneur creates something they believe themselves has value. And then they create raving fans around that value, right? Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you did that here at Smart Rap, right? I mean, you had, a, you had a concept initially and then it kind of morphed into something else. And now you're convincing people that having, I watch your dad do it every week at <laughs> B&I, he's fantastic. He, he holds up a really crappy view of a, a car and then he flips it around and he gets a standing applause, right? right. He's convincing so, yeah. people that, that wrapping your vehicle with a really solid brand is a good idea. So it's like one of those, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Stories. I, I, I interviewed Chuck Troutman, who's the um, director of Conscious Capitalism. Do you know about Conscious Capitalism? Uh, actually, yeah, I met, I met uh, Chuck probably about four years ago, briefly. Yeah. yeah. So Chuck, um, um, no, I mean, hang on a second. It wasn't Chuck Troutman. No, darn. So it was, uh, oh my God, Steve. Chuck is the director of the, 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 Ameri the, yeah. the, the Arizona Marketing Association. Yeah. I interviewed him as well. I can't think of his name right now, which is, of course, a menopausal moment. So forgive me, I'll come to come back to it. But the director of Conscious Capitalism, do you know about Conscious Capitalism? I, I believe, I, no, I haven't read the book, no. Um, the, the, um, basically, it's the founder of, of Whole Foods partnered with another gentleman whose, of course, name is still skipping my brain. But the concept being is that um, your stakeholders are, you know, very important to... So your stakeholders are your employees, your community, everything, yeah. right? And what, what, what conscious capitalism says is that first you, believe, but you start with a mission, and that creates revenue. And the director of conscious capitalism here kind of feels like, well, wait a minute, if you haven't got revenue, then you can't have the mission can't get fulfilled. So which comes first, the money or the mission? It's like chicken or egg thing, right? Right. So I, I think that you probably have to start with the mission, but you can't fulfill your mission without the money. And what he's saying is if you don't have money, then you can't make the mission work. So I think there's a lot of things in being an entrepreneur that is which came first, the chicken or the egg. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I guess I guess you're, you're doing the idea and then the execution, and that leads to the revenue. So I... I would I would say that that's the way it goes. Um, See the execution, right? That brings you back to what it is that yeah, I do. Exactly. I help I help business owners execute. Because there's a lot of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, they're all in this book over here. That. And that's what Kawas uh, Kawasaki says is that, that I there's a lot of ideas. But at, yeah. Ideas are easy, but execution is hard. Right. And so that's what my company, Michelizzi Enterprises, does. I help companies to execute. Now, what that project is. Depends, right? And I actually don't know what the project is until I sit down and meet with people and say, how do I refer you? I said, well, I don't know. I have to sit down and meet p people face to face and yeah. then go, oh, well, here's an idea. Let's do this, right? Yeah. So until I, until I actually meet a business owner, I don't know how I'm going to help them. So that's why my business really spends a lot of time building different kinds of ways that I can get in front of people and meet people. Because when I meet people, that's when my creative juices get going and I solve problems. Right. So you find, like, oh, say there's a there's a deficiency in this area or I can see this person they just mentioned that they're struggling with A, B, C. Or D, right? Yeah. yeah. And without, or they, they, yeah. Have, they say that they, they, either something blew up, you know, something mm. something like a, right a partner yeah. was stealing from you. Yeah. You're, you're so busy out there doing pest control, you haven't got time to like go police your partner. Yeah. So I've gone into a company and executed the, 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 the agreements that extricated the yeah, partner yeah. and got the, 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 the honest partner <clears throat> paid Back for the next track. five years yeah. and then went in and cleaned up the mess that that dishonest partner did to the books because they were having some money go this way and some money go that way, right? Yeah. So there's, there's a, okay, I've, I, I know I've got a problem, but I haven't got time to fix it. So mm -hmm. I'll go in and fix it. Yeah. But the thing is, it, it, it's not like you hire someone and you say, hey, here's what I need you to do. Go do this, this, and this. Usually when you have a problem like that, you have no idea what the solution is. So you need an entrepreneurial okay, mind yeah. So you say, I have this in. problem. I need you to solve it. Yeah. And the reason why I know that is necessary is I remember when I had my salon back east. I bought a building. And uh, when I had the fire code, the fire marshal come through, he it was like one of those I want to throw up days. It was like a laundry list of things I needed to do with the building. 
that the former owner had been told they needed to do and ha didn't disclose to me. Ah, so. And when I went through my, my inspection, my, my sale process, my file was misfiled with the wrong address of the state, so it didn't come up in my buying process. So I had like 65 grand worth of renovations oh. before I could even open the door. Right, even yeah. open it. 65 grand for a small business owner is like everything, That's right? a pretty big stubbing of right. your toe right there. Yeah. So I remember being up at 3 <laughs> o'clock in the morning going, okay, I need to fire rate the basement and I need to figure out this, that. I rate, I, I mm -hmm. need to irate. I need to... Um, I'm irate. I, I, I was irate <laughs> yeah. over having to egress the windows, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So I needed. To, I had my dad come in who was a, my, my original entrepreneur and help me get my book set up. Yeah. And I remember being up at four o'clock in the morning with my employee manual going, God, I wish I could just hand this off to somebody. Yeah. Wish I could just get to give them some bullet points and say, have at it, bring it back to me like in three days, right? Yeah. So that's why I, I created Michelizzi Enterprises was to be able to help business owners with those kinds of things especially. Yeah. And I love it when I, um, when I meet a business owner like that that needs that kind of thing. I remember when I uh, made the switch from being the VP of a pest control company uh, which is a client that I took yeah. on and I, I functioned as their VP for a period of time. So I was an entrepreneur for hire and that was the function I was working in. And then I went back to taking on new projects and I remember Jim Sphinx came up to me and he was a computer guy. And he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me get this right. I have this list of five things that this business coach told me I need to do. It's been sitting on my bulletin board for two years. I've been unable to execute. You will execute those projects for me? I said, absolutely. We had them done in eight weeks. We doubled his business. Wow, that's impressive. So A year later, yeah. He died of a heart attack. Oh, right. Yeah. I'm standing in front of his casket with his wife, and his wife looks me straight in the eye, actually up at me because they're all little peanuts. She's only four eleven, so they look yeah. up at me, and she said, "When my husband died, he felt good about what his business was doing, in large part for the work that you did with him." So there's that legacy legacy currency, right? Yeah, and we talked about that. Yeah, there's no so, better ROI than that. Yeah. When they when they made it, what what Jim had to sell when he passed away was his customer list. One of the projects on that list was making sure he had a customer list. That was one of the things they so sold to get her out to California. Yeah, something tangible more value for his wife. Yeah. Right. So essentially, that's what my company does. You know, we, I go in and I and I execute. Now it could be that you have a, a, a marketing initiative, or you have a um, an, you know, you have a pro an event that you want to put on. Yeah. You speaking have, of that event. Um, that's you know, it popped up into my mind. There's a, uh, I don't know if it's in April, or it's in Peoria. It is. It's, it was in Glendale, and we postponed okay. it for a period of time. Okay. But essentially, but, um, one of the events that I'm working on is like a multi arts event in Glendale to help a business there help grow their business, um, and they help artists to get paid. Mm -hmm. So I've postponed that event for now. What was that in, called again? It was. It was called the Ginormous Rose. Oh, the giant Omer's room. Yeah, okay. so when that when that happens again, I'll let you know. But one of the things that I do is I, I do projects, uh, the Art of Fearless of Doing Business, the Art of Fearless of Giving Back are two projects where I use my art and my um, visual journalism as the carrot, okay. basically, to get like-minded business owners to build relationships with each other. So essentially what I do is I tell the story of entrepreneurism by writing a blog and telling a story, and then I illustrate that story <clears> with a painting. <throat> At the end of the series, there's an art opening and the paintings are for sale. Oh, that's interesting. That's a, uh, yeah, I've never heard of anything like that. Be um, and so the, the paintings sell and then... Yeah, the paintings, at 70% of the time, they sell out before the show. Wow, okay. And so essentially what I do is I, I, I sit down with a business owner, I do a Facebook Live like this one. Yeah. Um, and I do a YouTube. And I, then I listen to it and I take five key takeaways. And those five key takeaways are kind of siphoned through my maverick serial entrepreneur mind yeah. and my advanced education. Um, and I come up with five things that you can learn from this particular business owner. It's basically for the business owner a great way to tell your why, right? Mm, okay, yeah. So the, the blog goes up and um, when, I, when I read the blog... And when I write the blog, it gives me an idea. So I'm a visual journalist. What I do is I tell stories and I illustrate them. It's just always been the way I make art, right? Yeah. So the painting is basically the why, that why distilled into a visual image. So at the end of the series, there's an art opening. There's always 15 paintings. There's an opening painting. There's 13 entrepreneurs. There's a closing when, painting. When's your next one? So the next one, the, the next up, one will be in probably November. Okay. So the the art of giving back is there is the art of fearless mm -hmm. giving back's you know a, a loving cousin. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. What I do in that one is every year I flip flop. One year I focus on a company and the and the charities they support, and yeah. the next year I focus on a charity and the companies that support that charity. So last year I focused on WebPT, 
and I inter- inter- interviewed all of their leadership team and talked about their core values okay. and how those core values related to the charities they, they chose. And so I interviewed the leadership of the charities. Um, and that opening was at the Arizona Science Center last May. This year, I'll be um, choosing the charity on Relentless Talk Radio. I'll be asking people to vote on the charity. Okay. Do you and have any in, in, on the I, short list yet? Or? I do, actually. The Leukemia Lymphoma Society is one of them. Okay. Um, Honor Health is one of them. The uh, Arizona Opera and the, and the um, Ballet Arizona are on there. Okay. Um, Help, which is a, um, a, home, a, a charity for homeless folks. Okay, good. Um, so there will probably be about 10 charities that we vote on. Um, the audience will decide who I focus on, and then that, that charity is given the opportunity to choose 13 donors. And what happens is I'm going to be interviewing the charity on the, their core values, and then all of the uh, businesses on their how their core values and the core value of the charity line up, and then the paintings are for auction. So the charity always gets 10% of the um, asking price, and anything that the painting sells for above the asking price, the charity gets 100%. So my goal in that series is to write a much, much bigger, a ginormous mm. check to the charity, <laughs> right? Uh, Roots also, a learning center in Glendale will be one of the charities that's, that we'll focus on hopefully this year. Um, so essentially what happens with that um, is the the charity doesn't pay me and the business owners don't pay me. Where I make my revenue is when the when the paintings sell and when the print-on-demand pieces sell. So all the pieces um, have posters and um, mm, okay. pillows and that so, kind yeah. of thing. So you can do a little bit extra on that. Right. Yeah. So this is a, a really the, the reason why I created those projects really wasn't to, as a revenue generator, it was a relationship builder. Because we were talking about this before we got started. Yeah. You know, why do some of our heroes like Gary, and I can't ever say his last name correctly. What's Gary's, what's Gary's oh, last Vaynerchuk. name? Vaynerchuk. Vaynerchuk. Yeah. I mean, what's, what's his currency? Relationships, right? Yeah. So, you know, why why do I do what I do? I, I, I do, create projects that allow me, the Relentless Radio is a perfect example, where I can create relationships with people. And in those relationships, they get to like, know, and trust me. So they'll either refer me a project or give me a project. And every project that I've gotten over the past five years have been somehow related to my um, my art series. Hmm. So do you find yourself wanting to do art more full time now, or you're happy to do that's that's like the? Well, you know, it's interesting. It's kind of um, if you would ask me the answer to that question prior to doing the five, I've done five series. I've painted yeah. 185 paintings over the past four years. Okay, wow. Oh, so that's a lot. here's what's interesting. When I was focusing on being an artist, I wasn't painting. Oh, okay. But so. when I found a way to merge art and painting, um, all of a sudden I'm prolific. And painting, um, yeah, yeah it, um, but yeah, business and painting. Yeah. All of a sudden I'm a prolific painter, Did, right? Is that because you had a And deadline? a prolific writer. Uh, yeah. I've written 85 blogs, right? Yeah. Um, there, there'll be books coming out this year of the, of the blogs. Okay. Uh, so what I realized is that in finding a way to, to marry my business brain and my art brain, they're no longer separate. Hmm. Okay. So my no art longer, yeah. is absolutely directly related to my business. My muse are entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are the thing that like light me on fire. They're, your stories are awesome. I lo- and that's why this whole this whole idea of telling other entrepreneurs stories and podcasts and you know interviewing people is so great because people love to hear the story. And I you know I was been thinking with this passion blog that I revisited last week at <clears throat> Let's Talk Radio. I was thinking about what am I passionate about? Like revisiting that. Like what's what am I passionate about? What was your answer? I'm super passionate about entrepreneurship. Huh. That's interesting. So, it, and what, telling what that story, what part of it is like, what, what interests me? That's yeah. the thing that get that lights me lights me on fire. When I sit down with an entrepreneur and they tell me how they got where they're at and what their story is, and we have that meeting of the minds and, and the heart, really, and then I communicate that story. What's really amazing is I like, for example, Deborah Bateman. She has Deborah Bateman LLC. She's yeah. a national chairman of the Bank of Arizona. She's someone I met ten years ago. Couldn't wait to do something with her. But I knew it had to be something good because she's busy, right? Yeah. So when I had this project come up the third year, I asked her, I said, Deborah, would you be part of this project? She said, absolutely, right? So I told her story, and I did their five cave takeaways, and I, I did the painting, right? Yeah. And when she saw it, both her and her husband like burst into tears and had like an epiphany. The name of the painting was called Risk Blossoming. Okay. And it was based upon a quote from um, Anise Nin where it, it says basically that... To to uh, just the one where you stay in the bud, it's, it's scary to stay in the bud than it is to blossom. Okay. So yeah. I said she has a coaching company. It's all about how people to grow, and so risk blossoming is the name of the painting. 
and she changed the name of her company to Risk Blossoming. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. So wow. How flipping cool is that? Yeah, that's a weird, weird coincidence. Right. Well, how cool is that, right? Like this, her, like <coughs> hearing her story said in that way was so inspirational to her that she literally changed the name of her company. <coughs> now you know that's art to me. It's social practice art. So I'm a visual journalist. I'm a writer and a painter. But more importantly, I'm a social practice artist where I unite business and art. So art, business, and community coming together. And that's the fun part for you? That's the fun part. All right. The social practice part of it is where I get my charge. So there, there's, no, there's no unmarrying them anymore. They're, they're forever together. I think for me, the, the fun, the, I guess not the fun, but the, the passionate part is the, the strategy, the creation of a direction, the, you know, what are we going to, how is this, how am I going to help this person? What, do they need a, a name for their company? Do they need a logo? Do they need some kind of like narrowing of focus, all of the above? And then putting that together and then seeing it work. The, the seeing it actually work, um, that's the fun part for me. Um, it results in, you know, whatever they... <laughs> You know, extra revenue. They when you get see them go, extra... oh, thank you so much for figuring that out because I've been noodling on that forever, and you just figured it out for me. So thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, it means better business. Uh, which, in, once you dig down, it actually means uh, happiness, which is that thing that we were which talking we were talking about, about yeah. earlier. The return on investment is happiness, right? <clears throat> yeah. And you know, and for me, it's like not necessarily one particular solution. But in collaborating with people, so I might meet somebody who needs a bunch of things, and one of the things I know they need is a wrap. Well, I could go ahead and design the wrap myself, right? Or I could put a team of people together to solve the problem. So I might be a solo problem solver, I might be to bring a team on. And so for me, another charge is, is that when I put together a team of like-minded people and business owners, and they all collaboratively pull together with my guidance and facilitation to solve a problem or, or take a business to the next level or add an initiative that was, would have somehow been flat and becomes dynamic. That also is, the, 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 the collaboration part is why I changed my tagline this year to <clears throat> collaborating way out of the box. Mm, okay. Because what, what I do is I'm kind of like a MacGyver with people. Uh, so you kind of put this, that, and you know, yeah, I Jerry rig shit. Rig it all together, yeah. and and you know stuff. that's not original to me. I watched my father do that my entire life. Hmm. You know, my dad owned a, a corporation in Vermont. He had six so companies. Where did, where did you grow up? In Vermont. Okay. So I was born in Brooklyn, and when I was two, my parents moved from Brooklyn, where my dad was a foreman of, of Lockheed at, at Lockheed in a, um, at an airport there in, in uh, at, at JFK, right? Yep. And he moved my family and I to and Vermont. I had a brother. Okay. And when I was two, my brother was eight, and he opened up a bicycle shop in Vermont. When I think about that now, it was audacious, right? My dad okay. opened a bicycle shop. <laughs> Maybe it's really audacious, right, to move a two-year-old, an eight-year-old, and, and a woman from Ireland who doesn't drive to Vermont in the winter to open up a bicycle shop. So he built a house and a building for the bicycle shop, and he and that was. Uh, and then later, the, he had a corporation that did travel and tourism, map making. He had a built, home building company. Um, um, and have travel and uh, tourism distribution company of the bike shops, right? Yeah. So I watched my dad and my and my godfather, who also lived in Vermont, had a dressmaking company, a bakery. Yeah. I was a professional so hunter. Is, is that where you grew up? I was where I grew up. I grew up in between these two crazy serial entrepreneur, Italian, strong personality dudes. In the middle of nowhere. In the middle of flipping nowhere, oh, right? Okay, so that's something we have in common. Right, right. So I grew, I grew up in basically what I call Twin Peaks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. if you dig back to 1990, that show. Uh, David Lynch. So yeah, hometown was pretty much Twin Peaks. And we're also raised by immigrants. Uh -huh. Your dad, your dad's from South Africa. Yeah. My mom's from Ireland. Mm -hmm. My dad's first generation Italian. So that work ethic, right? Yeah, that sort of start from nowhere. Yeah. And when you're in a small town, what happens is we call it networking, collaborating. My father called it survival <laughs> and being nice, yeah. right? So if you came to the bicycle shop to get your bike fixed, and you were, you know, there wasn't that many bicycle shops at that point in the 70s. It was the only Schwinn dealership for, you know, 500 miles, right? Yeah. If you can't get your bike fixed, I'd say to my dad, where should I go to lunch? And my dad would walk you out to the driveway into the parking lot that I had just swept, right? Yeah. And he'd point up the street into Gills and he'd say, ask for Frank's special. Okay. So and now you're 
Yeah, helping them. Was out. that networking? No, that's was that was literally where the best grinder was, right? To yeah. this day, I haven't had a better grinder. Hmm. It's something about their cabbage they put on there. It's fantastic. <laughs> so we call it networking. But my father called it survival. And so my father was always jerry-rigging stuff. He was putting together camps of things with, you know, with other people that are doing sports. And he had a, um, a camp they did at Castle and State College where there was the, he said, well, let's do ski jumping. Where does that come from? These guys from Brooklyn. I mean, uh, ski jumping, really? So he built a ski jumping ramp and a pond. So today there's a pond at Castle and State College that my father built for a ski jumping ramp that he just <laughs> jerry-rigged, right? So that's how I got into gymnastics. I, there was a gymnastics school, there was skiing, there was bicycling, there was motocross. So my father was always trying to find ways to make a living in Vermont. And so he taught me that. So basically what I do with my clients is say, okay, where are you at? What are you doing? Let me just get to know you. Yeah. And then once I know you, I know how I can help. That's so really it's all about building asking, relationships, asking right? Asking the right questions. Yeah, and just two human beings like talking. Yeah. Yeah. So after Vermont, you went back to the city? I went to Albany for college. Okay. And then I was in Manhattan for 10 years. That was awesome. Um, there you was went a, in your 20s? From 21 to 31, the best oh, time to yeah, be in Manhattan. Yeah, perfect, right? Totally. Like you're just looking for like the best pierogi. <laughs> just Veselka's on 9th and 2nd, by far, the best there? pierogi. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. It's a Ukrainian restaurant. It's been there for, I don't know, six generations, Ukrainian family. 24 hours, awesome. When I go to New York, I literally take the bus from the a bus or the train from the airport directly to Veselka's and have pierogi immediately. So I'm going to hit uh, Black Tap next time I go back there. Oh, that's a good idea. The, the crazy shakes. Oh, man. Yeah, they're like as big as this mic here. And <laughs> they put the, sh the, the thing, the glass in the freezer. Mm -hmm. And so when the shake comes out, they roll it in the... So the whole exterior of the glass is covered and stuff too. You know what? That's mm -hmm. art to me. That's a business, it's, it's right? But that's art. It's about 3,500 calories. Oh, it's fantastic. So I ate mine and I ate <laughs> half of the kids' one as well, plus a burger and a beer. Awesome. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, you could, you could eat whatever yeah. you want probably, right? Yeah, filled up my hollow leg here. And <laughs> <laughs> Isn't so, it funny how you, there's always like one thing that where no matter where you go, the best thing to eat somewhere, you always think of the one thing that yeah. uh, you want Butcher eat. Bar was great, too. Or yeah. They had, outside of... Arizona, the best tacos. Oh, absolutely! Like everywhere else outside of maybe San Diego does all right, maybe LA, but um, they had these uh, habanero brisket tacos. Oh, that habanero brisket. Yeah, it was. That's really art. Good. Yeah, it was really, really good. Wow, nice, super spicy, and they were they were like, Are "You guys sure you want to eat?" Wow, well, you know, we're from Arizona, so we'll give it to us. And I was like, "Wow, these are actually pretty hot, and this is good." <laughs> I just, is, you know, you think about how things are created, you know, whether it's food or it's a business, like, I don't know, any, any little idea that you possibly would have, right? I always imagine two guys or two chicks or whomever sitting at a bar yeah. and going, John, what do you think of this idea? You know, what do you think of, you know, creating an airplane and flying, you know, and, yeah. and, and making it, you know, or, or a rocket ship to go to the moon? I mean, you think about it, it's really crazy. And then doing it. And then doing it. Yeah, the execution the, of it is yeah. really the deal. I, I imagine, I don't know if this happened to you, but yeah, their 20s are filled with many, hey, this is a good idea, that after a while you start to get, a, I don't know if it's irritated is the wrong word, but um, less patient with a, an endless supply of ideas that go nowhere and mm -hmm. more interested in one idea that goes somewhere. And so... Everything's a yeah. good idea, um, you know. I think you kind of have to like, go like through to that, though. Do it, right? like, you kind of have to go through that kind of. So a lot of times I hear we should do this. Brainstorm. So I go, you should do that. <laughs> Let right. me know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to decide what you're passionate about. Part of it is the process of elimination, like the light bulb. You know, Edison didn't fail ten thousand times to make the light bulb. He basically figured out. 10,000 ways not to make the light bulb so you could find the one way that he could make the light bulb. Then and he wasn't get, even trying to make the light bulb. Then you get the bulb. idea from Tesla. From Tesla? <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of doing this. I'm just going to go down the road. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I, just, I, was, I was just in there. Have you ever gone into one of the Tesla stores? I don't I haven't read the... Uh, it, I could be wrong. I, I just somehow in my mind I thought that he sort of uh, had a lot of help from, from Nikola Tesla. Yeah. Uh, 
From Edison? Yeah. God, I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to take look a look at that. I might be wrong. I I'm thinking Tesla like the car. No, no, not the car. Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't even know. Is this funny? You don't even know who the original people were. Like, who were the original people that thought up the airplane? It wasn't the Wright brothers. There was like another. There was another. There was another guy that crashed was and guy died, and they, and they, they, they picked up the pieces and all. So yeah. Like if you just, <laughs> right. man, if you just ran a little faster, <laughs> put a right. motor in it. Right. That's right. <laughs> don't jump off the cliff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, yeah, I think that your twenties are are um, if you're lucky. Yeah, I'm always feel blessed that I spent my time single working for myself i had a marketing company and a, a personal training company was in new york and then also working for big companies like um revlon revlon was like one of my biggest free customers. to fail without con without consequence basically i think without you, have to, you have to have a time in your life where you i don't even know if it's like a time in your life really when i think about it i think wandering is super important you know wandering and kind of fumbling around and failing is just part of succeeding it's just part of it. You have to kind of try stuff and have it not work out and have it fail miserably. It's just part of the process. Yeah, it doesn't seem so cool at the time. No, but, it doesn't. Um, it's painful. When you think back, you know, all of the what's really funny is you look back in life and some of the funniest stories are they were not funny at the time that was happening. And now <laughs> right, you're like, right. man, that's so funny how I totally broke my leg. <laughs> oh, you know, my yeah. Right. Oh, it's so funny how I, uh, I failed so miserably. And isn't that <sighs> weird that you're now like thinking it's funny? Like, well, you know what's cool is I think <clears throat> that I'm 51 this year. So the benefit of age is that I can find the humor in things as it's happening, right? Oh, because I yeah, because I've been uh, around it. Yeah, that's the that's the the benefit of age. Is that you realize you live through other stuff. Yeah. Now you're like, oh, ha, ha, it's happening again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I also know that God's not done with me yet. You know, the idea that even if I'm going through something, it's it, things aren't going my way. You know, I have a couple things that aren't going my way right now. You know. That's but yeah. But it's just part of the process. That's kind yeah. of an overwhelming amount of things don't go your way. <laughs> All the time, right? I mean, yeah. it's just part of the deal. And uh, but I always think to myself as I'm going through things not working out or things not going my way that man, this is going to be a really good story one day. Like I know, yeah. all, I, that's the thing like, about that I've down. learned mm -hmm. with all of the entrepreneurs that I've interviewed is that I used to ask them, the, the, I used to ask them, why did you start your company? What was the first fear you had to overcome to start your company? What do you, um, um, what was the first big um, bump in the road that you hit and how'd you deal with it? Everyone has a big story. Like, oh yeah, I remember. Yeah. One of them actually was a bump in the road. I'll tell you about that in a second. <laughs> And then what are you afraid of now that, and, and, and how are you getting through that? And then what can you tell other business owners about being fearless? On the fourth question, I don't ask business owners anymore what they're afraid of. Is there an answer? Do they have answers? Or... The, the first thing they tell me is I don't have fear. Yeah. Is it, It's not that I don't have fear. They kind of backtrack. Well, related to business. But right? what they say is, is that fear is just part of the deal. It's part of the landscape. I, what I have is a concern or a challenge or an opportunity. But I don't have, I'm not afraid like I was when I first started my company. When I first walked away from that corporate paycheck, or I was first mm. forced to start my company because I couldn't find a job, which is essentially what happened for me. I, I, I started my company because I just got to the point where I was unemployable. I'd been so entrepreneurial for so long that it was hard for me to get a job. Oh, was that scary? Sure. I mean, like, I would love for someone to just pay me an easy check and not to worry about mm, stuff, okay. right? That would be great, right? Just not the way my life worked out. So, but what happens is after you've been entrepreneur for a while, you just know from dealing with ambiguity so much, which is what the topic is this week on Fearless um, Relentless Radio yeah. is uh, is dealing with ambiguity. You just know that there's multiple solutions to every problem, and you really have to come up to the problem and say, okay, here's what's available right now. I'm going to choose this. Yeah. Where Let's does see. where does that fear come from? Where do you think that? Is that a voice in your head? Is it even your own voice? What is it? Why, why well, is it there? Both. I mean, I think, well, I think fear number one is good, right? If you fear fire, that's a good fear, right? Don't put your hand in the flame. You're going to get burned, right? You know that yeah. if I put my hand in the flame, I'm going to get burned. So fear, I think, is in one level, like, you know, uh, back uh, to the caveman yeah. days, big tiger, run, right? Yeah. So it's important to have that, you know, ajita, uncomfortable feelings. I think those are important. They tell you something. Um, there's lots of things that I that I that I have a healthy and, and reasonable fear from, right? But I also think it's about you know fear of the unknown, uncertainty. You know, Anthony Robbins says that uh, you know every human wants certainty, but also we want uncertainty because if you ha if you lived like, in a certain we, we world, like you'd be bored surprises. to death, right? You know what I mean? But yeah. I, I think that fear is about 
what you what you know is true and what other people have told you is true about what should or shouldn't be? I think, yeah, I don't know. Like, the only thing I can come up with is I'm not that I'm fear, but the thing that concerns me is the, the so health and, and well-being of, uh, of the people that mean the most to me. Um, right. The fear that I don't know what, like, what that is, really. I mean, it, it would be maybe a bit of angst. Hey, this could, this might not work out. Hopefully, that happens before we've wasted too much time and money on it. See, that's the thing. But like when you when you've been an entrepreneur not, for a while, um, you know, my biggest fears have happened to me. Right. I just recently had a big fear happen. Like, okay, there it is, right? And guess what? The next day after I went to sleep, having that fear happen, the sun still flipping came up. Yeah. And, and then it went down, it, and it like, came up, and it yeah, went down. You and you realize, thing, yeah. you realize, you know what? The worst thing can happen to me, and somehow I'm going to get through it. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, my um, my brother took his life in '84. Oh man. You know, so That's... my my parents got an opportunity, and so did I, to live through the the, the death of a loved one, loved one by their own hand, right? You think that's the worst thing that could possibly happen to a parent? And quite frankly, it is, right? Yeah, I would have. That's what I'm saying. These fears, like you know, my mm -hmm. kids are still young. You know, the teenage years, I didn't. Uh, the reality my is, if, if God forbid you know, something like that were to happen, yeah, <clears throat> you would get through it. You'd come out the other end a different person, I'd, I'd imagine. And you would also yeah. be able to help other people have the same experience. I can't tell you how many people over the past thirty-two, thirty. I guess 34 years now my brother's been gone have you participated in the uh, out of the darkness no I yeah. haven't I haven't done yeah, that one yet it's a uh, it's a nationwide walk um, I was in that uh, I don't remember what the date of it was I think it was December maybe December 15th they had it at, at the um, Steel Indian School Park huh. and uh, it's a suicide prevention yeah. awareness yeah yeah so that that's re it was really um, really interesting and uh, yeah I don't know how to, else to describe it <clears throat> without getting too um, too into it but I, I would you know I'll talk, suggest it looking into that um, I'll check it out yeah I think in every experience that you go through good or bad or indifferent there's an opportunity to learn and grow and then have something different happen on the other side whether no Hopefully, matter what right? it is like, you know I mean just no matter what <laughs> it know. is and so sometimes you know, I, mean, I feel like I'm making the same mistakes over and over. And that's part of the learning yeah. process too. You know what I mean? Like if I stop for a second, like when you start getting going down that rabbit hole of fear and like regret and all that crap, like the, blah, the that stuff. Yeah. If you stop for a second in the middle of that and just go, wait a minute, what am I learning? What am I about to learn? You know, take a deep breath. You know, yeah. I just had a couple friends pass away this week. He had a heart attack and and his girlfriend couldn't handle it, and five days later was gone. That's crazy. We think. I don't know. We'll have to see what the autopsy yeah. says. So two of them gone. Poof, gone, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the reality is that all these goals that we put for ourselves, business-wise, art-wise, personal-wise, like it really, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that right now, this is what you and I have. Mm. This microphone, having this conversation, this is our life right now. And right now, everything's fine. Right? For the moment. I've got yeah. gas in the car. Yeah. All our people are, are alive. All Absolutely. the bad things that have happened have happened. We don't know what's going to happen in the future that really... What happens for business owners, and I think people that are really awake, that are living their life awake, is they become very present to right now. And you can only do the best you can do in the moment. You know, you can only say, here's the next right thing, and well, shit, let's see what happens. Yeah. Now, do you do you read a lot? Or Yeah, yeah? I'm a okay. prolific reader, yeah. I don't read. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I, but you know what's really cool? I also listen uh, to books on tape. I, not because I don't think they're useful, it's just... Well, I you know, I think that there's a lot that I listen to books on tape a lot too. I think I'm that's so busy. that's helpful. Yeah, the books. On I just listen to I just listen to unfuck yourself. Really? You have to listen to that one. Okay. Number one, because the guy who wrote the book, who, of course, his name is escaping me right now. So go ahead and Google it, people on on on, on the yeah. powers that be. Um, he's Scottish, and his diction and the way he says the oh, way man. he the way he enunciates is hysterical. Scott. So is he kind of like that character off the Simpsons, Groundkeeper Willie or whatever? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a, oh, right. Fuck your shirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the, yeah. The, one of my favorite chapters is um, I am not my thoughts, I'm what I do. And I think mm. entrepreneurs know that. Like, you know, you can go ahead and be completely <clears> flipping <throat> out. Like, people will say to me, Michelle, like, you look totally look like you got things under control all the time. Like, if you could see what's going on in my head, you would know it's not true. Right, I and mean, there's always doubt, and I wonder, and hmm, maybe, and, and self-talk happening for everybody, right? 
Oh man, that's interesting. But you're not your <laughs> thoughts; it's what you do, right? So yeah. it's like okay, and I, that's why I do the projects because while I'm waiting for the right client to show up, the projects are showing people that I know how to execute a project, and showing people that I'm <laughs> relentless and that I'm a, have stick to itness and that I can get shit done, and then I build relationships. They also an opportunity for me to talk about my philosophy and the things that I think, right? And so in the process of doing. Even if I haven't got a client or if the other things are falling apart, I'm still doing. And so that keeps my self-esteem and my, and my ability to keep on moving forward in check because I'm doing. And that's what that chapter talks about. It's like, you know, you actually can change your mind by changing, change your thoughts by changing your mind, like acting as if. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like even if you just get up and clean the bathroom sometimes. And in, in, the, in the artist's way, um, there's a book called The Artist's Way. And she, and I, I oh, heard, that's so weird you mentioned that. I. And, yeah, you've, you've read it, right? Well, I got to the part in the very beginning where it's saying, you know, 95% of the things you worry about will never come true. Mm -hmm. And to prove that, why don't you write down all of your worst case scenarios, did right? Did you have one of them come through? <laughs> we talked about this. <laughs> and I did that. I did right. that, right? right. I, I'm like, you know, it, it could be... You know, all of these things, divorce, foreclosure, bankruptcy, you have to move back <laughs> check, in your check, house check, with check, your mom right. and dad, like, <laughs> check, you check. have to get right. a, a second job for minimum wage, blah, blah, blah. And Yeah, but you know what? Then, That's what led you here. I was, you wouldn't I was have cleaning up here. some boxes about 10 years later, <laughs> and I found this book, and I opened it up, and I'm like, holy shit, every single one of those things come true. And I'm and laughing about it. congratulations. And I'm laughing, you know, so it's like breaking your leg and you're like, oh, that was really funny when I broke, yeah, that was funny when I went through all of that. And, um. But congratulations. But now the, to the story I tell is that if you, I, all of your fears can come true. So, so it's not exactly motivational to people that are like, hey, you know, only 90, only 90% of the things or, you know, 90% of the things don't come true. And I go, well, 10% is like pretty you know, one out of ten things that you think that's gonna, that's gonna actually come true, and then they they get a laugh out of it or whatever. No, it's true. It's, so I mean, I, I think all that seven things I wrote down came true. That's hysterical, and, and, I, and I say congratulations because, and you and I have had this conversation because you had a similar story in some ways. If the worst happens to you, happens, and you survive it, <clears throat> then that's you really actually. I feel a whole new freedom, yeah. having had some of the bad things that have happened to me happen. Because what I realize is the worst can happen and I can live through it. And not only can I live through it, but I can excel and become something I hadn't quite even anticipated. Come out like of I don't even know what's right. going to happen Come next. Like I'm stronger. super excited because the, it, it's really kind of a good place to get to a place where you realize, wow, I've got no more good ideas. Because mm -hmm. that opens the door to the truly good idea, right? When your preconceived notions of how things should be, your expectations aren't being fulfilled, then you can actually show up in the present moment and be present for it. Let's see what happens. Now, when you first start your business, that's the scariest thing you could possibly imagine, like not knowing where the next dollar is going to come from, what's going to happen next, because you want certainty. But when you get to a point where you realize, wow, I don't know what's happening, and that's adventure. So in my blog, in the, in the, in the um, uh, Dealing with Ambiguity blog, I ride motorcycles. And so I kind of think about dealing with the ambiguity like being on the Kangamangas Highway in New Hampshire or Needle Point Highway in South Dakota. You're just doing this thing. And you can only see like 50 to 100 feet ahead of you, right? And then you got to react, okay, yeah. right? That's fun. I mean, when motorcyclists look for twisty turns like that because we like the idea of not knowing what's going to happen next and just going with it. Yeah. That's when we get completely out of our minds and into our the experience, Instead right? Of All of a sudden, you're <clears throat> smelling everything and you feel joy at a whole level. And yeah. it doesn't matter whether it's motorcycling or whatever it Instead is. Instead of right? the drive from Kingman to Vegas, right? Which is Which like... You're... Right? Yeah. That's brain numbing. That's where me and Gabe almost ran out of gas, actually. Right. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's brain numbing, right? We and, realized on that on that big straightaway <laughs> that, that it had been on empty since we left Boulder. And so I made it from Boulder to Kingman on empty. Wow. And we were driving like 45 it's like the, miles the fish, an hour. It's like a fish is a, fish and love story. coming into Kingman, uh, it actually ran out of gas and we we're just like <laughs> rolling down the hill into Kingman. Slowly rolling into the gas station. 
<laughs> I put like 32 gallons into a 27 gallon tank. See, and that's what happens. Like you, when you are in that point of like uncertainty and, and it works out or you have, that's where the great story, that, that's where the magic happens, right? But when you're have a full tank of gas, you're on a straight road and you have it on speed control, you just, it's so brain numbing. There's parts of Ohio on your, I've ridden my motorcycle across country three times. There's parts of Ohio where I really wish I could just bungee my legs up on my, on my, da, yeah. on my handlebars and just fall asleep and wake up on the other side. That's for entrepreneurs. That's what a job is. What right? kind of bike do you have? I had well, I had a soft tail. Okay. And her name was Ruby. I sold her last year to buy a vehicle without a car payment when I was buying my home. So okay. I've been doing a blog series about replacing Ruby, and even that series, I thought it was going to be all about <clears throat> finding the right motorcycle and buying it. Right? That is not what replacing Ruby's series is about. Like, it, what's it about? It's about being okay with where you are right now and being patient with not knowing what's going to happen next and finding joy in that place. I don't know when I'm going to replace my motorcycle again. I have, you know, I'm in a new relationship and he has an extra bike. Yay. But it's his bike, <laughs> right? Hot rod. And it's, it's hey, same bike, same bike as Ruby, right? Bike week's coming He's fantastic. Yeah. You blow on this thing. It's down the road, yeah. right? But at some point I will replace Ruby. And, um, but like, that's kind of like what I was talking about. When you get to that point where I thought the worst thing that would happen to me is I sell my motorcycle. I said I would never sell Ruby. That'd be like me selling my guitar and my amp, right? Exactly. That's not but true. I realized, like, you know, it, 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 that I had to sell her and that it gives me the opportunity. Number one, I've been test riding all different kinds of motorcycles, where before it was like cheating on Ruby. I, I, mm -hmm. I wanted a soft tail, I got a soft tail, I rode the soft tail. But now I'm riding, I've ridden a street glide, a road glide, I've, I, you know, I, I've ridden all kinds of things. I don't, I don't even know what the kind of motorcycle is. I might be an Indian, it might be a Harley, it might be something else. Um, Doc and I might buy a might build a completely custom bike, which would be what a cool story would that be to show people how to build something a bobber from nothing, right? Right. So, so I don't know, but I think that the biggest lesson I've learned over the past, I would say, five years is that to be um, to find joy within uncertainty, like true joy, like belly laughter joy, like complete encompassing joy having had my worst fears happen and having had the darkest nights of the soul. You, you to come out on the other side. Again, right? Pardon? <clears throat> you had it happen once, so you don't want it to happen again. So that's the that's the thing, right? You You're... know what? What I found <laughs> doesn't even matter. Hmm. Like it doesn't matter what happens. What happens is is where I am is contingent upon my spiritual condition and my attitude. So that's the biggest lesson. The, whether the worst thing is happening or the best thing is happening or the mundane is happening or whatever is that I'm present in my own space and then I'm able to be of service, you know? That's the most important thing. So then, then when, when you have that attitude, then you're really free. And, and that's when you can fire a client. Yeah, 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 you can fire a client when, when you don't know where the next hour is coming from because you know that client's too expensive. Because anybody that emotionally or, or physically or financially sucks the life out of you is too expensive. But the most expensive thing that, that a person can do is waste your time with drama. Like I just don't even, that's, yeah. that's the beauty of being older. Yeah. I didn't know that when I was 20. I spent a lot of time dealing with drama. Didn't know that in my 30s, thought I had to. In my 40s, I really thought I had to put up with a bunch of shit, right? Yeah. But now in my 50s, I'm like, you know what, this is my life. I get like another 30, 40 years on this planet if I'm lucky, right? I have friends that are dropping dead now all the time, heart attacks, overdoses, all kinds of stuff. It's yeah, it's um it's like I don't want to spend I, one second yeah. of my time like <clears throat> with a client that doesn't treat me respectfully. Like yeah. I just don't. It's this passage of time thing that starts to creep up on you, right? Mm -hmm. Um thing that's ha been happening to me lately is a lot of uh you know, my high school teachers are all passing away. And you're like, "What? Already?" And they're like, "Oh geez, he was 80." It's been 30 like, years oh, since I was right. oh crap, like Right. And so I always visualize this as like a conveyor belt. And as a baby, you get on the conveyor belt. And as a grandpa, old person, you fall off. Right? And yeah, then, we're, we're, and, like, and new, we're pretty much like this. And now I'm halfway, maybe yeah. a little bit past halfway. And you're like, ooh. But <clears> here's the thing is, if you used like, to think you're guaranteed a certain amount of time. Like, I'm going to get to 80, 85, like midlife. You're not yeah. guaranteed shit. You could speed up and bam, off you go. You could walk out. The, I could walk <clears> out the door <throat> here today and have a car accident and be gone. A couple of years ago, I, I stopped counting at 40 people in the two-year period. I, I went to 40, over 40 funerals. I stopped what? counting. That's crazy. So one of the byproducts of knowing a lot of people and being this relationship person. 
Oh, um, I don't have a, a boundary between business and personal. I, okay. I do a stuff stuff in the recovery community. I do a stuff in the arts community, stuff in the business community. I networked. I'm in the philanthropy. I know a, a, a shit ton of people. Yeah. So one of the byproducts of that is you more people die, right? Right. So if and, you know like four thousand people, then forty is a small percentage of them. But it, it sounds like a. Oh, it's, I, yeah. I I would probably think that it, since that probably sixty funerals in the past five years or so. Two more that I'll go to, you know, sh- shortly. I'm a biker, so I'm, yeah, you know, so I, lose, I lose people yeah, th- yeah. from motorcycles. <clears throat> but you know, quite frankly, I've lose I lose people from all kinds of stuff. And motorcycles are part of the landscape. But I think one of the the lessons I've learned is that um, none of us are guaranteed anything. So would that be a, a thank you, blog post, something that you uh, lessons of on loss? Yeah. Yeah, I think I always Maybe like. A, have you done that yet, or is I that, haven't done that one yet? But that. I probably, I probably will. Loss, do loss. personal, business, whatever it yeah. is, right? Like letting go. Yeah. Because once you once you've done that, like you're leading up to this, you know. It's it's the friction of holding on to something that needs to be let go. Yeah. Right. And once well, it's let go, you wake up the next day, the sun's shining, and you're like, "Holy cow, I'm free!" Right, you're free, and you know, and the, and the, and the reality is, is that. Um, I was just listening to the, to Cody Bateman, the, the founder of Send Out Cards, spoke last week, this week actually on the on the third, and he taught you. Do you know the the, the company Send Out Cards? Yeah, I think we're going to actually be uh, using them. Yeah, for, it's, yeah. it's a fantastic <clears throat> thing. So I'm a distributor of, of Send Out Cards, and it's one of the tools I use with my clients. And so I got great chance, and I'm going to be on Cody's uh, blog uh, podcast coming up. He's going to be on Relentless Talk Radio. He talked about when he was leaving um, his home state, I think it was, to go to New York for a big job. You know, the whole happy yeah. story and he got this prompting <clears throat> he used the word prompting to go hug his brother goodbye and he ignored it and uh, three o'clock in the morning whenever you get a call at three o'clock in the morning yeah, it's really not good it, yeah. um, he his brother passed and so send out cards was actually created from his reaction to loss on relentless talk radio this past week had Luke Kayyem who's a life coach and um, Todd Herzog who's a musician talk and both of them started their companies because of loss. Hmm, that's weird. Uh, so Herzog that's weird. had a 28 year old girlfriend die of leukemia, and Luke Kayyem's mother, at 25 years old, um, died, and, and he found her dead after many hours in a tub oh, wow. at 25 years old. My brother committed suicide. So, you know, and I don't say committed suicide. My brother made a decision to take his life, and I've never been angry at him for that. That was his choice, and he was free to make it. How old were you at that time? I was 16. Okay. Yeah. You know, my, my brother made a decision to end his suffering, and, and I've always respected <clears> his decision, <throat> never been angry at him. I'm not advocating for suicide in the no, case, but, but yeah. that was his personal decision. And, uh, you know, what, what my brother taught me was everything I need to know about compassion and tolerance. You know, so when, when I am in a reco- room of recovering people, and a homeless person walks in who's smelly and, you know, yeah. still drunk or whatever, I'm the first person to bring that person a cookie and a coffee. You know, I just, my, my brother taught me everything that I need to know about compassion. Right, because the human being is still inside of that, of that shell. Yeah, that, and my judgment of whether someone yeah. smells or where they're at or what they're doing is really, it's none of my business, yeah, right? My, 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 my job is to be loving and kind. Yeah, exactly. To the best of my ability. Now, have I ever not been loving and kind? Sure, I'm a human. Mm-hmm. I've, 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 I've screwed up. But my job is to be loving and kind. My job as a professional is to bring my best skills to the table. Right and to and to be a contributing member of society, and not allow my skill set to stay in the closet while I do some brain numbing thing that's comfortable. You know that's that's not. I want to look back on my life and say, you know, I I earned a salary. I want to look back on my life and say, I I showed up. That legacy. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, no one regrets. Um, I mean, how, how is it that the the, um, the closing of unfuck yourself? He says you're not going to look back and regret not being thin. You're going to look back and regret all the times that you chose to not be healthy. Right yeah, when you're exactly. dying of yeah. something related oh, I to obesity. Have done that, yeah. Right, not like uh, yeah, man. I should have wore different clothes, or I should have been yeah exactly more healthy. You, you're thinking maybe I would have had it yeah, more. Yeah, would have, yeah, and, and the reality is, is that <clears throat> this is when I when freedom really comes in. 
I have a, a, a goal, okay? My goal is to gross $1 million a year and to gift 100,000 of that to charity and to create an endowment that gives 0% loans to small business owners and, to, and continues to give to the charities that I've served perpetuum after I die. That's my right. legacy, right? Okay, so you've got a plan to do this. I, got, I, got, I have a plan and I'm working that direction. Because you get stuff done. I, I get <laughs> shit done. However, <laughs> if I don't get there, Okay, if I shoot for the moon and hit the stars, mm. I will have no regret. And I still have no regret. Okay. Because it's not the goal that's the goal. It's the doing that's the goal. Okay, so it's the opportunity to, to try and reach that goal. It's just like, it's not what I think, it's what I do, right? So if you show up every day for your life and you're giving 100% towards whatever your goal is and you don't reach that goal, that doesn't mean you failed. That means you, left, you led a genuine life. I liken it to, this is my my uh, analogy is, I don't know, do you remember a family vacation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Griswolds, the, the best part of the movie, well, uh, besides the end where he flips out, but the whole getting there, right? Right. You might find that when you get to the destination, you're actually a bit disappointed. Well, that's the wall thing, like, was closed, right? And, you were wrong, right? Yeah, but did. the whole thing, like, <laughs> well, it was closed, you know? Right. So, getting there where they're, they, you know, grandma on the yeah. roof, the gal in the red Ferrari, and, you know, the whole thing And was, you gotta wear your goals lightly, too. Like, you can be three quarters away the there and go, squirrel, and yeah. realize that this was a better thing, you know? I mean, it's absolutely, I mean, you can't, the goal is irrelevant. It's just showing up every day and being an authentic human being and being present and loving, right? I mean, you have to love, love your customers, love, love the people at the grocery store, love, love your, your family, love your kids, you know? Have you uh, paid attention or noticed anything on the uh, Phoenix uh, mayoral candidates? No. Uh, they had a uh, debate, I think it was last week or the week before. It um, looks like pretty promising because both candidates had pretty strong... Uh, plans for homelessness and um, I think both of them f focused on if I'm not mistaken on housing first um, which seems to be a, a, you know I follow this kind of stuff yeah outside of work and um, I think it's worked in other places uh, you know I don't normally get into into to politics and stuff like that but what I find I, I find confusing is is the dismissiveness that comes across from people that are otherwise good people and the uh, I don't know they not not being able to recognize that every one of us is only one or two bad luck moments away oh uh, bad decision bad Absolutely. luck my present company included Absolutely. away from being, being homeless yeah it's not Unless you're an actual billionaire or, you know, multi, multi tens of mil like that you can weather most uh, medical bills and uh, other things, you're, th that's the only sort of, in the back of my mind, sort of fear is that you, there's things outside of your control that um, if you don't, ha I don't know. Hey, you don't I have lived, the right I, frame I, I of mind. I lived in my the car, car for, for a couple of months, lived in my car when I was, when I was uh, in my Right before I came to Arizona, actually. And, um, you know, every time I take a shower and I have my shampoo there, it feels I'm good, flipping right? thrilled, yeah. right? It's, it's the truth. You know, I mean, people think that homelessness is only... I, when I first left um, college, I worked for a, um, a, a women's shelter in New York City. It was, it was the Salvation Army Women's Shelter. And I had 75 people on my, on my, uh, my client list, right? And there was one client that her file was about this big, and I thought, you know, there's got to be some truth in this client. Some, something in here, there's some level of truth, you know? Essentially, she had Alzheimer's, and she just left her apartment one day and couldn't, get her way, couldn't find her way back. Her daughter was in Brooklyn. She had been in the shelter for 12 years. Just, they couldn't find her. She was the one person I was able to get out of the shelter. She came from an upper-middle-class family. Her family was in Brooklyn. They Indeed. came and got her, and that was it, right? Oh, wow. So, you know, so how long did she spend there before 12 years, 12 years living in the last stop before hell shelter, like 10 blocks, 51st and first, like, I don't know, yeah. a couple blocks from the UN, right? With duly diagnosed crazy people of all shapes, size and yeah. forms. Right. Um, 
you just, you know, there was another client that I had that was making her five kids breakfast one morning and she had a, a psychic break and she just l- left the eggs on the counter and jumped out the window. Mm. Ended up with a club foot. She, lived- Dual- she had, she, she had a, lost her heel and, you know, this real, you know, kids went into foster care. Yeah. Couldn't get her help. You know, just couldn't get her help. And mm. she ended up taking her life. But like the day before it happened, she was <clears throat> going to work and, you know, working class. So there's that uh, level of like, I don't know, I, we haven't talked about it yet, but gratefulness is the other yeah. side of the, the fear. Yeah. Right? So we can you can be cautiously, you know, hey, this is a risk. Yeah. But not paralyzed by it. And then grateful that you still have the opportunity. Absolutely. You know, I mean, and the reality is, is you just got to show up and love yourself and other people. I mean, that's just really essentially what it all comes down to, right? Mm-hmm. When I take on a client, I'm helping their business. It's be, I'm really, I bring love to the table in that situation because the business owners that I work with, I mean, it is about putting their kids through school. And I was telling you about what about Schmidt that I was, a uh, when I was in grad school, I worked for a company called IDX Systems Corporation, another, another corporate job. Yeah. Um, I was hired as the administrator. What do they do? They, uh, they um, medical software. Oh. They're now owned by GE Healthcare. And uh, I was hired in the HR department to administer, be the senior administrative coordinator for the leadership department. Of course, once I got in there, they realized I could design things, and I, I designed a wellness program. So yeah. I designed a wellness program for them. I, de- I designed all of their physically, like their graphic design for all their um, health products, and I administered the leadership program. So... Um, uh, Dennis was my was my um, my boss at the time, and he was delivering a, a training to all the C level executives across this huge organization. So what a great opportunity! I'm in grad school for administration with a concentration of organizational behavior, and I'm in a C level training that I would need to be literally a C level employee to have this training. And he's talking about a movie he used to use video clips all the time. Yeah. It's called What About Schmidt. And, um, Not what about Bob? Yeah, what no. about Schmidt? <laughs> and uh, uh, J- uh, Jack Nicholson <clears throat> plays the main character, and it opens up with him. He's at his retirement uh, Is there a lunch. Movie? It's uh, no, it's about fifteen years old. Okay, yeah, I'll it's at his you. retirement. Like his he's movie. at his retirement lunch, and and uh, it's bo- one of those boring bad yeah. tie. People are not paying attention. You know, yawning kind of yeah. lunches, right? And he's worked his whole life as an insurance guy. And his whole idea is to rent an RV and travel around the country with his wife, right? Well, while he's having his retirement thing, and his wife is at home cleaning the floor in the kitchen, she has a heart checked up, drops dead on the kitchen floor. He comes home and finds her dead. So that whole so this whole exercise window, yeah. was like, okay, th- there's there's something that didn't go well, right? Yeah. His daughter, who was actually played by Hope Davis, who was one of my clients when I was a personal trainer, so oh, it was wow. one of her first films, and. Uh, I had the, the, the luxury of training some really exceptional human beings. I mean, I would have paid to show up at these people's <laughs> houses, okay? So they're fantastic people. All people you'd see on the red carpet today, they're just fantastic. So when Jack Nicholson comes home, he's like, okay, well, I worked my whole life, and now my kid doesn't talk to me, and my wife is dead, and, you know, I got this RV. So he gets a, um, a pen pal in South, in South Africa, and the whole movie is him writing to the pen pal. And he says something to him that literally like made the whole room stop and has stuck with me forever. And I will be forever grateful for Dennis Lambert for putting this story in my head. He said to this pen pal, I think his name was a Dubu, um, if you don't do something with your life of significance, it will be as if you never lived. And you think about that. It's true, right? Like if you don't do something that's left after you're gone and create a business or something, you know, it's something of significance. It will be as if you weren't here. In a way, yeah. I guess if you if you're, yeah, I guess if you live, if time goes on long enough, then that significance fades, and it's like you never existed. Exactly. Right. So I don't know how many. How so what many, a waste uh, of life would that be? That God gave me this life to live, yeah. and He gave me all these skills. I, I there's a line in the Bible that says, "To whom much is given, much is expected." Right. And basically, what you know, I believe in God. You can, you know, some people don't, but that's kind of my deal. It doesn't have to be a Bible God. There's something bigger than me that makes the sun go up and go down every day. It's not me. I didn't put it on my agenda. It happens every day without my permission. So there's something bigger than me out there, right? But I believe that God gave me like a shit ton of gifts. You know, I mean, He made me creative. He made me. I can write. I was like, is it so that I, I can solve problems. So you better do something. With so them. I have yeah. to do something with yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. And if I don't, it will be as if I've spat in the face of God, right? Like I've... Maybe it's like that that story of the, what is it, the menorah? Not the mm-hmm. menorah, the, 
I can't remember what the name of those things is. They're they're sort of like uh, tablets, mm -hmm. and they're worth something. And um, one of the guys just buries it because he he thinks that God is uh, dangerous, and if he loses it, he'll get in trouble. Right. The other guys use these forms of currency to generate more money. And so when God comes back to collect, the one guy pulls it out of the ground and he didn't do anything with what he was given. And his excuse was, well, I didn't want to, you know, I knew that you were vengeful and I, you know, and the answer was really funny. If you knew that I was vengeful, you would have known that that was a bad idea. Why did you do that? You know, if having, so you now you're just making stuff up. Right. Whereas the other guys, they took that, that God given talent and they made the best with it. And so the result was not only did this guy lose his tablet, but he gave it to the other guy. Right. <laughs> so I've, sometimes in, in, in parenting, you're like, all right, you didn't, you didn't eat your dinner, no dessert for you. Not only are you not getting to, I'm giving your dessert to your sister who ate all of her food. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, right. But or, then now your sister's fat, yeah, so yeah. I'm going to know. All right, <laughs> so I'm taking away your iPad and I'm giving it to your brother. Right. You're like it's a double whammy, so it's a really... Uh, you well, know. you know, I think we our, our big thing is to find out what our thing is and then do that thing. Yeah. Like to the best of our ability, right? And and finding, if, if, if your life is just a, a relentless search for finding that thing, then your life's not wasted because at least you tried to find that thing. Yeah. If you just settle for... Well, if you're happy settling, then cool. That's that's fine, right? Well, nobody's happy when they settle. Well, you know, I'm, I found my thing. I'm happy. Well, if you haven't found your thing, you're settling for oh, something okay. else. Okay, okay. And you're just too afraid to use your tablet differently, right? Yeah. Um, then then that's not a life well lived. And my whole thing yeah, is I about... I want to... the name of that. that I, I've told this story quite a few times and I haven't forgotten what the name of that thing is. Not the. Don't you hate that? The menorah is a candle issues. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. menorah is okay, like. Okay, so. Dang it. It's like the I've, I've, it's like not remember the author of them. Fuck yourself. It drives me crazy. <laughs> it's, 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 it's we start, what starts to happen. You know too much stuff. For the longest time, I couldn't remember the word paradigm. Every time I try to talk about the thing that is the thing that. Um, the paradigm shift, right? Yeah, even that, I'm like it's the thing that everything's based on. What's the word for it? I don't hate that. <laughs> for like right? 25 years. It gets worse as we get older, too, because it's like I, I used to be on the tip of my tongue. Now it's like nowhere to be found, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you and I could talk for like ever. Forever. Yeah. Right into Friday night. Yeah. Um, you've got another appointment coming up. I do. Soon, right? So I do. And so, and so do you. We have a business to run. Oh, we yeah. had a really great conversation, oh, yeah, though. Yeah, right. We'll have to do this again soon. We do. You'll have to come on Relentless Talk Radio. We'll pick a Tuesday night for you to come out. Okay, good. And, and we'll, we'll talk about we'll, other things. We'll, we'll organize it, and we'll, we'll get it done. Awesome. All right. Cheers. High five. Awesome. Thanks a lot. <laughs>